Welcome to uh, the Pumps 101 series basic hydraulics and in this particular webinar uh, we're going right down to the very basics. Um, just talking about the basic principles and, and forces that work uh, in a pump that we really don't see maybe every day and a lot of us take for granted but believe me they're there and uh, it's good that we understand and, and know how they work. Um, one of the things I'll mention now and I'll probably say it again is I never had so much respect for water until I actually worked for a pump company. And this is uh, coming from a background of me growing up on the farm. Even as a farmer, I mean, we respected water, don't get me wrong, but I never understood how hard it is to get water where you need it, how to control it, and how precious it really is, and how dangerous it can be, actually, too. So today, let's talk a little bit about uh, just basic hydraulics. Uh, this is going to be... Uh, more of a just a sit back and observe it. Uh, you don't have to think too hard on this one. My name is Dan Featherstone. I'm with that Pentair Training Institute and uh, let's go ahead and get rolling. Now as we always start our webinars we just want to take a quick moment to remind you of some other opportunities. Uh, you're probably watching this on the Learning Center as it is so you know how to get there. Uh, should this maybe be on the YouTube or whatever uh, let you know uh, you can get to any of our learning opportunities it can be found under any of our websites, if you go to the resource tabs, uh, say if you go to stayright.com, berkeley.com, whichever one, F.E. Myers, Hydromatic, all of them will eventually have a resource tab that you click on. On the main page, on the left-hand side, uh, you'll see there's uh, learning uh, Pentair training opportunities. The Pentair Learning Center, we have a lot of modules out there, the webinars, other information. It's free. Use it as you please. Uh, just uh, sign up and we'll get you going. You can also follow us on Facebook.com uh, slash uh, Pentair Training Institute uh, where we'll have different updates telling us where we'll be and such. Uh, the Pentair Pro Dealer Program I like to mention because uh, every company out there has some sort of reward program. Uh, I don't care who what company it is, pretty much all of them have them now. Uh, so yeah, you can get neat things like watches and cameras and etc. But more importantly for dealers and more importantly for installers, there's labor and extended warranty programs. So definitely look into that. That's really a good add value. Uh, you can read you can read about it, find out more at www.penterprodealer.com. We also have an access portal for our distributors and our dealers. Gives you 24-7 uh, access to productivity, availability, pricing, etc. Uh, Miss Amy, uh, she's always there to help you. Give her a call at 866-880-3771. Last but not least, don't forget we have factory schools. Uh, especially the ones here in Delavan. Uh, you get the factory tour. Uh, also understand with any of our schools, they're usually about a three-day school. Uh, but we don't let you sit for more than about maybe 90 minutes or so. We get you up and moving, even if it's just for a break. But typically, we get you up and moving to do labs and hands-on experiences. Where not only are we going to talk about like the meters and the pumps, but you're going to get hands-on and see them. Uh, it's a good value. Uh, check it out. Again, you know how to find us. We're right there on the web. Resource tab, Pentair Learning Opportunities. One of the things I mentioned earlier was, I never appreciated all the properties of water and how water uh, is such a big force and a factor in our life. I mean, yes, I was a farmer when I grew up. Um, I still live out there in a the farm, but we just don't do much uh, cattle or, or such anymore. Uh, I kind of jokingly tell people I wasn't that good of a farmer. That's why I'm doing this. Uh, but that's not really true. But anyways, uh, the properties of water we want to talk about, you know, we want to talk about how it works how it affects goes, how water going through the pump will affect different pressures and such, and, and how it all gets to the homeowner. There's three states of water. Um, this drawing here is kind of an oversimplification. Um, you have water in vapor form. You have it, of course, in liquid form. Now, in vapor form, it's usually pretty harmless, uh, meaning that, you know, we know the cycle. Water evaporates up and forms clouds, precipitates back down in water. Uh, in a form of rain or snow. More importantly though, we always have to be careful in our industry about when we mess with vapor and steam pressure. And we'll talk about that in a minute. One of the things I like to mention about though is that water is actually in its most compact form as a liquid and people forget that. It's because of hydrogen bonding. A lot of people say, well look at that picture. You have a picture there and no, that's not an outhouse. That's a, fi uh, that's a fishing shack. 
Uh, that's uh, here in Wisconsin, we find it a sport to go out on the frozen lakes and try to fish. Uh, and a lot of people would tell you and think that when ice is uh, there, that that's its most compact form of water. And in fact, it's really not. Water has a thing called hydrogen bonding. Now, what hydrogen bonding means is that it actually gaps. When water freezes, it actually expands. That's why it breaks pumps. Uh, or, but it, it expands and creates pockets, if you will, so it becomes lighter and less dense as far as molecular structure, and which is a good thing because if water didn't do this, lakes would freeze from the bottom up, killing all the fish, and life here on Earth would be very difficult. So fortunately, water has hydrogen bonding. When it freezes, it expands a bit and thus floats. So you have to understand and respect that when I say water, oddly, is in its most compact form as a liquid, it is, in fact, most compact because the hydrogen bonding isn't as present there. Now, I talked about steam and how many of us have gone into a pump house and seen the PVC pipe like that. Now, I want you to understand I travel a lot for my job, and I had the privilege of working uh, in Florida and in actually Nebraska, too, and talking to, oddly enough, people that work for uh, the power authorities. And understand that a lot of the power authority, your power companies, uh, they generate using steam pressure. And I had the opportunity to talk to a few of their engineers, and I always heard that story that one inch of compressed water one superheated could fill a 10 by 10 foot room. And I thought, well, is that just a scare tactic, an exaggeration? And I asked them, and they said, oh, no, that is true. They said, depending upon the circumstance, when you superheat water and you see, for example, this PVC pipe like this, you don't want to see this happen. Because when it explosively lets go of that superheated water, that water will flash to steam. Uh, pipe this size will easily fill a 10 by 10 foot room full of steam. The closer you are to that pipe, the worse the damage will be as far as burns. So one caution, and, and we must respect water in that when you see a pump in runaway condition and you see a pipe bulging, get out of there. Try to deactivate that pump from a distance and let's hope not that the disconnect for the pump is in the room right next to that pipe that's swollen like that. Even cast iron, I've seen it. I don't have pictures here for you. You'll just have to take my word. I've seen pictures of 100, uh, 150 horsepower uh, Berkeley uh, centrifugal pump that uh, the customers installed it without safeties. It went into runaway condition, and it even ruptured the, the cast iron pipe. So you have to respect water. Uh, like I say, I've never had as much respect until getting a job like this and understanding all of the conditions of water. Always treat it with respect and always have safeties available and installed properly. On the suction side, people will ask, well, what does it do there? And, and a lot of people will argue, well, on the suction side, it will do just this, collapse the water, thus cutting off the water supply. And my answer to that is, yes, it's true. Often it does collapse like this. However, you still have the water trapped inside the pump, which you're superheating. So please make sure you have all your safeties properly installed. Now, when we start talking about water, water has an equilibrium. It always seeks its own level. So if I have a tank here, and on the left that tank is full of water, and I open a valve that's connecting the two tanks, the tank will then, water from tank A will flow into tank B and will equalize even if the tanks are offset or at a different elevation. The tank on the left is full of water. It will empty that water to the best it can, depending upon where the pipe is, to equalize the level of the water. Okay, So water always seeks its own level, which is good. So, for example, here is a picture of California. They use aqueducts to run water great many miles from the mountains into, for example, the Fresno Valley. And they use gravity to do this because, like I said, water seeks its own level. So if you can design the aqueduct large enough to allow for free flow of water down to point of usage, you will have these aqueducts running all over. 
Uh, Romans, for example, were extremely good builders of this type of product. It's also very key in designing a well. So if we're at ground level, we're going to drill down until we hit the standing water level. We're trying to hit ground water. Now ideally, and I don't want to talk a lot about well theory here, but you're trying to get usually below a clay non-permeable uh, barrier where you get cleaner water below. But either way, we're going to drill this well till we get to our drinking water level. We're then going to put in a casing and probably a screen material to help keep the heavier debris out. And we're going to set a pump and we're going to start to pump. And when we start to pump, we create a cone of depression. Because water flowing through substrata like sand or gravel is unlike an open body of water. It can only flow so quickly. And so you get this drop. This drop or this cone of depression that we get from our pumping is called an equilibrium point or a drawdown level. It might also be called a working level. It might be called pumping level. It could be called any various things. But what we're trying to tell you and explain is that on these reports, uh, they often will explain how far the water is anticipated to drop and at what gallon per minute. That tells you what the system can be designed to. Now, the one thing I always laugh is people will tell me, well, you know what? You never have to worry about that in an open body of water. And my answer is simply this, you're wrong. Just as free-flowing water running down a drain will create a vortex, will create this void, it's because water is being pulled out of that system quicker than it can collapse upon itself. Uh, in a lot of times in our industry, we call it net positive suction head available versus net positive suction head required. Uh, now, if you've listened to any other of these lectures, we do have uh, co that covered. We talked about that, especially with submersibles. Uh, with our submersibles series, uh, the advanced submersibles, we talked about that. Uh, but don't fool yourself and think that any size pump can pull from any size body of water and never vortex. We do have to be careful of that. Oh boy, a little physics. Uh, you know, it's one of those subjects when I was in school, I always anticipated in being a teacher, but in, for example, social sciences and history, because um, I enjoyed those subjects. And you're probably wondering, well, if you studied education, why are you here? Well, long story short, I love teaching, but I hated the parents. <laughs> so I, I became a trainer instead. Um, so let's talk a little physics though, because now that subject I thought I would never have to learn about, I'm now helping to teach it. We don't realize it, but we use it every day. Uh, Newtonian law, uh, Newton's basic understanding of physics, uh, we use quite a bit and we don't even realize it. For example, an uh, object in motion remains in motion or at rest until acted upon by another force. People would say, well, how does that adapt to us? Well, simply, friction loss. I only have so much pressure to push the water so far, and when I exhaust that pressure due to the friction losses, I no longer move water. There you go. Uh, what about force equals mass times acceleration? Well, that's a simple one, cavitation and water hammer. Uh, so we use these principles, we just don't realize it every day. Uh, now, Anton... I can never pronounce his last name, so I'm going to say Mr. Henton. Uh, he also talked about the conservation of matter and energy within a closed system. Okay, That energy and matter cannot be created or destroyed, only converted. Um, I know one of the best ways to understand how matter is converted is, for example, if you have a campfire, when the wood burns, you have ash, heat, light, and it also generates some gases and such. So the wood doesn't magically disappear. It's converted into another form of matter and gives off energy. Pumping systems are the same way. And in a closed system, if I start with 10 gallons per minute at a pump, I will get 10 gallons per minute out of the pipe at the end of the line. If I start with 60 PSI at the beginning of the pump, though I might only have 53 PSI at the discharge. And you're asking yourself maybe that, wait a minute, didn't you just say we can't create or destroy energy? And we're not. Remember friction loss. We can measure it. We can account for that loss of pressure energy. 
So understand in our system, everything is accounted for, all of it. Centrifugal force, aka the center fleeing force. This is often one that's hard to understand. A lot of people call it the center fleeing force. It's often open to your objective, okay? When you're talking about a centrifugal pump, understand that we're throwing the water forward, we're pitching it. And so it travels along the vein, making contact of the impeller and picking up velocity, okay? We'll explain this in more detail. But when you're talking about centri centrifugal force, if we really threw the water straight out from the center, the impeller veins would be straight, not curved. We curve them to increase the contact time. The longer you're in the water, the longer water's in contact with the impeller, the more velocity it picks up, the more pressure potential it has to build. Another way to look at it is if you look at this drawing here, uh, kind of like a tether ball game. This ball is on a string and it's swinging, and the force visually you think is pulling it straight away from that center pole. The reality is, however, if I were to suddenly cut that line, would the ball actually travel out? No. What it actually does is it continues forward on that tangent from where the line was cut. That's why water doesn't just fly out of the impeller. It is thrown out of the impeller following the curve of the vein, remaining in contact for a period of time and picking up velocity. Okay? Bermuli's principle. Oh, boy. There's a lot of math there. And uh, if you've ever talked to me or had any of my classes or lectures, you know I'm not a big fan of math. So let's make this easy for you. So Bermuli's principle, boiled down into simple English for you, is simply this. Velocity and pressure have an inverse relationship. In an enclosed system, if the velocity increases, pressure will decrease. If velocity decreases, pressure will increase. If you listen to my jet uh, lecture, you'll see that a jet within a pump, the jet with the nozzle venturi, use this principle very closely. So remember, Bermuli, he's a lot of math, but what he's just really telling us is that velocity and pressure work opposite each other. So let's start talking about pumps. Okay, let's talk about that impeller and the suction. The impeller has made up of primarily a few parts, about five or so, depending upon who you talk to. Uh, I laugh at that because I know some people say, well, the exit or the port, there's different names for it. Uh, but we're going to talk here right now about the impeller. We have the eye of the impeller, and that's your central access point. Uh, that's where the eye of the impeller fits into the diffuser or the volute case, creating the suction chamber or the low pressure point in which water enters. Water would then travel uh, across the vein, and if you see there, the vein is curved. It's curved to increase the contact time. So it, it will follow the vein out through that passage, and if you notice, the passage, too, goes from narrow to a little bit wider to help increase the velocity, uh, giving it more room to, to flow. Okay, water then will exit the port or, or the outer peripheral, if you will, and it, it leaves there. Now, one of the things I want to tell you, especially with a plastic impeller, uh, is that uh, when you heat a plastic impeller by deadheading the pump, like we were talking about and creating all that steam, one of the first things you'll see collapse is the impeller peripheral. The port will, will fold in on itself and collapse, pinching off the water flow. Uh, if you have a pump that you thought maybe ran uh, to, a, to a closed valve for too long or to a deadhead condition and you lose your flow, especially with a plastic impeller, yes, you, and it'll be very visual when you take it out. You can't miss uh, that. Now, the other thing we have here is the impeller peripheral. That is the outer diameter. The greater the diameter, the more velocity in which the impeller can impart onto the water velocity energy. So the greater the diameter, the more head or more pressure we will get. When you talk about that, you also have the hub, and I, I don't want to forget that. The hub is where it threads onto the pump. Um, Often, I want to point out, the hubs are often bronze or brass or maybe even a stainless steel, and the impeller is molded to it. 
Uh, and I mentioned this because I can't count the times people get a new impeller and they don't realize that the hub is in there. They look at the pump and if it was deadhead condition or if the impeller melted or spun off, the impeller plastic portion falls off, but there's still a hub there. You have to remove the hub. I mentioned that just to remind people because I've, I've had that question too many times in customer service. Uh, so often when the pump impellers are superheated, they will spin away from the hub, leaving the hub attached to the shaft and the impeller just falls off. You still have to remove that hub, remember. What determines the gallons per minute is a fair question. Uh, a lot of people ask me that. Um, first and foremost, it's the diameter of the eye. You can only fit so many gallons per minute through the center of the eye of the impeller uh, and maintaining less than 5 feet per second. And the reason we say 5 feet per second is because when you get over that, you will start to begin to cavitate the eye of the impeller and do damage. And we can tell when you do that. Uh, so your first determination is the diameter of the eye of the impeller. Your second uh, indication is going to be the width of the impeller. And I mention that because remember, if the plastic impeller gets damaged or, or heat damaged, that port will often start to collapse a bit and your flow will go down. You might not lose pressure, but you suddenly start to lose flow. That's an indication that the port has been damaged. Okay, now you also have the number of veins. The more veins, the less flow, but the more control and better pressures you often build. Uh, for example, a jet pump or a centrifugal pump, uh, even a submersible pump for a residential application might have anywhere from five to seven, maybe even more veins, uh, depending upon the flow they're trying to achieve and the, and the head. Uh, now, conversely, a sewage pump might only have two veins. It's not designed to build a lot of pressure or head. It's designed to move a large volume of water with solids in it quickly and efficiently through the pump, through the pipe, and out of the home. Uh, now, also note, when you're talking about a multi-stage unit, like a submersible pump, um, or our DSS-4HG, for example, uh, you have multiple impellers. The first impeller, we always say, determines the flow for the entire pump. So if you damage or lose that first impeller, if it's plugged, it's going to affect the flow for the entire unit. Okay? When you fit the impeller into the volute case uh, or diffuser, uh, you'll notice that at the cut water there, it's very narrow. And as it progresses counterclockwise, it gets wider. What we're doing here is the impeller pitches the water out. Now, I remember I told you the greater the radius, the more, more velocity you're going to have. Um, so that's one of the things I kind of mentioned, like if you're a baseball fan, for example, you'll never see a four foot two professional baseball pitcher. And I'm not being mean to short people, but the fact is you just don't have as great a radius of arm. You can't get as much velocity onto the ball. Often your pitchers are, are taller and have very longer uh, long arms. Um, and and they, they often use that full radius as best they can, meaning they stretch that arm out as far as they can as they're pitching in order to increase the velocity. Okay, so basically the impeller is like your pitcher. It pitches it out. Now, as it exits the impeller and goes into the cut water and is allowed to spin around, you'll notice it goes wider. So the water, which is coming out at high velocity, suddenly has a larger area to move through, so it slows down. Using Bermuli's principle, I told you what happens. If we lower the velocity of the water, pressure must go up, right? Okay. So that's where Bermuli comes into play. So the impeller creates the velocity, the pump chamber, the volute case or the diffuser, here's a diffuser, creates a change in velocity which thus builds pressure. Now we can measure the flow of a pump through a, a flow meter or a various meter uh, that will tell us gallons per minute, liters per minute, however we want to report it. So one of the ways we size a pump is to determine the gallons per minute. Now, if you've listened to the primer about uh, pump curves, you'll know that the other thing we need to know is total dynamic head. What is total dynamic head? I mean, gallons per minute is easy to understand. 
you know, how many gallons in a minute does that pump put out? Simple answer. Head is, is a little bit more complicated to understand. What it really simply comes down to is this. For example, to have a 12 inch by 12 inch by 12 inch box, a perfect cube. And if I fill it with water, I know it's going to hold 7.5 gallons of water. And it's going to weigh 62.37 pounds. I also know the base is 12 inches by 12 inches. So 12 inches by 12 inches is 144 square inches. Doing a little math, I can tell you that each inch, 1 inch by 1 inch by 12 inches tall, is 0.433 PSI. Who cares, right? Well, we care. But more importantly, who here uses a half a pound of pressure? We don't. That's silly. So to make it a more usable number, we divided one by 0.433, and we came up with 2.31 feet of head. What we're seeing there, so you understand, is a 1 inch by 1 inch column of water, 2.31 feet tall, is the same as 1 pound of pressure at sea level. Okay, And remember, this is at sea level. So that means if I'm standing on the beach there at Daytona and uh, I have a water tower that's 23.1 feet tall, at the bottom of that pipe, if it comes down to the beach, it would show me 10 pounds of pressure, okay? It's a, it's a 2.31 to 1 uh, ratio. So we can use this number very effectively. That means if... 1 PSI is equal to 2.31 feet of head. Then if I take PSI and multiply it by 2.31, I get foot of head. Okay. Or if I have feet of head and divide it by 2.31, I have PSI. A good example of this is if I have to lift water 231 feet in the air, I'm going to lose 100 pounds of pressure in doing that. So if my pump only builds 80 PSI, it will not go that high. It won't do it, okay? So that's another way we can use it. Now, one of the ways we use it every day and don't realize it in that Mother Nature gives us a lot of free energy to work with. You know, I always kind of laugh where I hear people talking about, oh, free energy, free energy. Well, there's no real true free energy. Don't get me wrong. But Mother Nature does provide us with some that we can manipulate. Now, at atmospheric pressure... And all this stuff we breathe in and, and we, we uh, live in has weight to it. We forget about that because we're so accustomed to it. Uh, but if you were to go out to space and come back, you would find on your pressure gauge, if you zeroed it out in, in, out in outer space and brought it back to Daytona Beach again, there would be 14.7 pounds of pressure. And a lot of people would say, who cares? But we care. In our industry, that means in a perfect world, if I create a low pressure point in the center of my eye of the impeller, which remember the impeller spins, the water evacuates, and there's a low pressure point. Mother Nature pushes the water in with 14.7 pounds of pressure, which means that in a perfect world, 14.7 times 2.31 is 33.9 feet of suction lift. We don't live in a perfect world. I'm a very conservative kind of guy, so when I train, I tell people that because there's issues with plumbing, because we don't machine perfectly, because the pump and machine will wear, that we can only pull water effectively from 25 feet at sea level. Do you ever wonder how that number came to be, 25 feet of suction lift, when you look through the different catalogs? Some companies report 27 feet. It all depends upon how the company feels they wish to report it, but typically 25 or 27 is very typical. Okay, It's because we know we don't build perfect pumps and you don't plumb perfectly. We account for that. So that's where that comes from. Now, as we go up in elevation, if at sea level we have 14.7, if I go up 2,000 feet... I, of course, have less atmosphere. Believe it, yes, you lose atmosphere, okay? For every 2,000 feet, you lose 1 PSI of atmospheric pressure up to about 6,600 feet, and then you lose it quicker. So if you are doing a project over 6,600 feet, you'd want to contact the factory to find out some of those numbers. Uh, but keep that in mind. So say, for example, in Wisconsin... 
where my farm is, I'm 1,000 feet above sea level. I lose a half a pound of atmospheric pressure. Not noticeable uh, as far as a human, but will a pump see a difference? It could. It potentially could. Especially if you go to Mile High Stadium in Denver, now you're definitely losing some suction. What it is, it's all about net positive suction head. And it's a hard thing to understand, but we talked about it earlier in that the water can only replenish itself and keep in a liquid state to a point. Now, not to get into too involved into this, but because a pump is pumping water at higher velocity than gravity would allow it, we have to see how much of the atmosphere and a column of water, the weight of that is needed to keep the water entering the pump properly and not cavitating. Uh, we talk about this in more advanced classes. I just want you to kind of understand, again, that was that net positive suction head required and net positive suction head available. That's where those two numbers come into play, and it's all about the weight of the atmosphere and the water column. If you violate this, we know it. Because often if you're cavitating the pump because you're not have the correct amount of water column and air pressure above the water surface, you'll start to cavitate the inside of the eye of the impeller and start doing damage. You can see where it's been eroded and damaged. Uh, also, you can also do this by not plumbing properly, putting an elbow or a fitting right next to the section so there's turbulence, and you put that turbulence into the eye of the impeller. So it's very careful, first of all, how you install the pump and where you install it, as far as water column and such, and how the flow will be allowed to enter the pump, but you also have to make sure you keep a few simple rules in mind as far as plumbing. Now, one simple rule, any elbow fitting or any fitting you should have six times the diameter of the pipe between the fittings. Meaning that, for example, a one inch pipe, six times one is six inches. You should have six inches between each fitting to allow the water to become laminar again or, f or center flowing, free, you know, proper flowing before it goes into the next fitting or the eye of the impeller so you don't cause turbulence issues. Uh, if you have a pipe less than one inch, say three quarter inch for whatever reason, you might be doing that, probably on the discharge hopefully, minimum of six inches is always a good rule of thumb. If you have eight inch pipe, that means ideally you would like 48 inches between each fitting or before you enter the pump of straight pipe to allow for proper flow. Now let's talk about the discharge. We got the water into the pump. I told you the impeller determines the gallon per minute. It also puts velocity in the water, which the volute case or the diffuser converts it into pressure energy and discharges it. So as we discharge, we've got to talk about how quickly can water flow through the pipe. In this setting here, we have a one by one by one foot pipe. Let's just say we're running water and for that volume of water comparatively, it can only pass so quickly. So in a one foot by one foot by one foot, if we had say 100 gallons per minute going through there, it would take one foot per second to travel through a nice big one foot pipe, in this case square. Now if we were to reduce that one foot pipe to a six inch pipe, six inch by six inch, it would have to be four feet long in order to accommodate the flow of water compared to the one what I'm trying to explain here is that water can only flow so fast. The larger the volume of water, ideally the larger the pipe you want. If the one foot by one foot accommodates a one foot per second flow rate, if I reduce it, understand by going to a six inch by six inch pipe, I now have to have four seconds to travel to get the same flow through the pipe. Your velocity jumps quickly okay the smaller the pipe the faster the water often has to travel so size matters okay if in a two inch pipe i'm running 20 gallons per minute it will flow slower than if i drop to an inch and a half pipe that velocity energy has to increase in order to get that same 20 gallons per minute through it 
What this also means, though, is that there's a direct proportion to it. That's the nice thing about flow. If you double your flow, do you double your feet per second? Okay, so let's look at a chart here. We have a half inch pipe. If we flow two gallons per minute, you'll see on that chart, it flows 2.1 feet per second. Without looking at the chart, if I now want to flow four gallons per minute, I would know it have to move 4.2 feet per second. The chart verifies it, okay? So that's one assumption we can make. If I want to double my flow through any given pipe, I must double the feet per second or the speed it has to take to travel through that pipe. Okay, direct proportion. Okay, so if you double your flow, you're going to double your speed. Now, it's not true about the energy loss. Remember we talked about that? We can't create or destroy energy and how you can have PSI, but after 100 feet you lose PSI. It's all about the velocity, the size of the pipe, the gallon per minute, and how much tumbling and turning and, and fighting the pipe does the water lose its energy. Again, looking at the same pipe, 2 inch, 20 gallon per minute, the velocity energy isn't that great, and neither is the friction loss. However, put it in your confined space. We go from 2 inch to inch and a half. The velocity must automatically go up in order to move 20 gallons per minute through a smaller pipe. That also means the water is going to tumble and rub and fight the pipe more, increasing the friction loss, thus lowering the pressure. So if you're looking at that same chart, okay, if you double the flow, do we just double the friction loss? The answer is no. Let's look at two gallons per minute. That friction loss is 4.1 feet of head. Now, remember that conversion we talked about? You're thinking feet of head, big deal. Remember, that's PSI. If you take 4.1 divided by 2.31, you wouldn't know how much pressure you're losing. Now, on the chart here, we can confirm it. Now let's look at four gallons per minute. Remember, velocity, we're only doubling our feet per second. But look at the friction loss. It went from 4.1 at two gallons per minute to four gallons per minute at 14.8 feet of head. Okay, it more than tripled. That's significant pressure loss. Remember, 14.8 divided by 2.31 tells you how much pressure you're going to lose. So don't assume, well, I'm just going to double the flow. It can't hurt that much because the velocity is just going to double. The friction loss is going to go up much quicker. Okay. Now, why do you hear me talking every now and then about 5 feet per second and 7 feet per second? On the suction, we have a limit. And as a pump manufacturer... We recommend less than 5 feet per second on the, su on the suction to reduce cavitation and to allow smoother flow into the eye of the impeller. People violate it all the time. I know that. But if you violate it or do it for a prolonged period of time violating the speed, it will, mark my words, damage the impeller. On the discharge, we recommend a 7 feet per second. Uh, once you get much over 7 feet per second, especially when you get over 10 feet per second, you will start to have water hammer issues and possible cavitation of fittings. Uh, the faster you move the water, the more low pressure points you create, the more damage potential there is out there. Um, we do review this more and we'll do our pump 101, for example. Uh, but we recommend as a pump manufacturer 5 feet per second on the suction and 7 feet per second on the discharge. Licensed plumbers would tell me, oh, no, 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 we can do eight feet per second in the home. Well, that's fine. If that's what your code says, that's fine. This is a recommendation that we make as a pump manufacturer. What is cavitation? First of all, cavitation is not pulling in air. Everyone thinks it's an air leak, and no, it's not. There's no air leak. Air leaks, air compresses, will make the needle of the pressure gauge bounce, um, and it doesn't make noise. When you pull in air, it typically doesn't make noise in the pump. Cavitation is boiling water at room temperature. Uh, if you've 
don't believe me, we have other videos on that out there that we can show you. Um, but literally what you're doing is, is you're pulling in water so fast that you're going well above the five feet per second mark that the water gets such a low pressure point that it literally turns to vapor. Then as it travels out, that water vapor or cold steam, if you will, gets to the outer peripheral where the pressure changes and it collapses. And it sends out a little ping. And when I say a little ping, for example, when you boil water on the stove, um, I'll do it often while making dinner. I'll start the water boiling. And I can always tell when the water is about ready because you'll hear the pot start to ping a little bit. Uh, you'll hear that noise of, of the, the, the water vapor. That's energy. Okay, so these little pings are actually transfer of energy into the impeller. And if you let it go long enough, that energy will hit the same spot hundreds if not thousands of times per minute as the pump is running. And in the case of like, for example, cast iron, it will often punch holes right in it. In plastic impellers, often what happens is the the damage will loosen the impellers and they'll often separate. Uh, stainless steel will be strong, 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 and also on this shatter. Stainless steel has the habit of shattering uh, rather than punching holes, uh, like cast iron. Bronze, bronze is a much uh, softer metal. It smears. It's like someone's cutting grooves into it. So cavitation damage is significant. What cavitation damage is doing is that it, it, it's it's just shrinking your your impeller and chewing it down and you're losing your velocity okay so all of it is happening because right in that eye of the impeller you're not paying attention to how fast the water's entering okay so when you cavitate because of flow okay cavitation happens in one of two places we already talked about the eye of the impeller but it also can happen on the discharge. You're flowing too much water. You're on the two. You're running too far right of the curve. You're running to run out condition. However you want to put it, you're running with no back pressure. Uh, a pipe ruptured. Very quickly, these little bubbles will cause damage, like you see here in the picture. This is an 18-inch diameter impeller. We've effectively cut probably about an inch to an inch and a half off of the peripheral through cavitation and thus the pump doesn't lose flow it loses pressure it loses velocity what we're saying is is remember I want to talk about the impeller here's the eye of the impeller the eye of the impeller spins counterclockwise it spins 3450 rpm okay now the impeller is a solid object so at the outer peripheral it's still spinning counterclockwise at 3450 RPM. Okay, so the whole unit is a solid mass that's spinning. The larger the radius, the more velocity I have. Because the water at a smaller diameter, like the eye of the impeller, it doesn't take that long for it to go all the way around as compared to the outer peripheral. Now, in some days back, uh, and even nowadays, some people still trim impellers. By trimming the impeller, we physically cut the impeller down to a smaller peripheral or a smaller diameter. Now, again, by cutting it, it's still going to spin the same direction at 3450 RPM. But because it's a smaller diameter, it takes less time to go around the whole impeller. Thus, the velocity is lowered. In that 18-inch impeller I showed you previously, by punching those holes in there, we might as well have trimmed that impeller down because the water can escape prior to leaving the outer diameter and it loses velocity. Less velocity means there's less energy to convert into pressure energy. See? Now, don't forget about the good old mass equals force times acceleration. Uh, Looking at this, and we don't want to pick on anybody, but they were breaking the discharge. And if you look at this, you can see on the suction to begin with, it's not terrible, but they don't have a really good linear or, or straight flow into the pump. They're reducing right at the pump. But worse yet, to compound it, 
Look at the discharge. They have an elbow literally capped right to the pump. So that water comes out, and one of the things about water is water hates to turn direction. And so it water hammers or, or reflects back. In this case, it did it so hard, you can see in the picture to the right, or I'm sorry, in the picture to the left, you can see where it's cracked the housing and it's been leaking water. They tried to weld it or to solder it there, uh, but anyone who knows metal as well enough can tell you that a pressure vessel does not hold up well to welding like that. Uh, once you've broken the original cast, it's very difficult to repair it, if at all possible. Uh, and the sad thing is, is that this is all just because of plumbing, okay? So that's where that rule, again, remember the six times the diameter rule is to be respected. I know that was kind of quick, but that was some basic information we wanted to give you. I hope you have a little bit more respect for water, like I do. Um, and, and understand a little bit more of the forces at work. If you take a few things away from it, it, this lecture is to remember, look at the velocity of water. How fast is it moving through the pipe? That's a first key, okay? Because if you maintain five feet per second on the suction and seven feet per, per second on the discharge, typically you're not going to have a lot of issues with friction loss. More importantly, you limit your cavitation. Second thing is think about how you're plumbing. Remember, six times the diameter of the pipe is how you should space your fittings. So if you're running two-inch pipe, you'd want 12 inches between each fitting, ideally, especially before you enter the pump and exit the pump. Okay. Uh, these are always works in progress. Thank you for spending time with me. Uh, if you have ideas for other webinars you'd like to see, do drop us a note at training.institute.penter.com. Uh, we always like to hear back from you. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, this is Dan Featherstone with the Pentair Training Institute. Have a great day. Take care.